What better way to start Friday than with morning sex with your beautiful wife? Me and Jeanette have been together for three years. Life is good. That's all you'll get until Monday. Are you afraid that others will become jealous when they hear your joyful cries? Something like that. Well, in that case, see you until Monday, too. This made me giggle and roll my eyes. This is how our Friday began. We both took the day off. Jeanette also took Monday off. My vacation was ending, so we returned on Sunday evening so I could start work on Monday. We were heading to the mountains for a weekend of skiing. Jeanette's best friend, Emily, and her husband, Steve, rented us a cabin five miles from the ski resort. We did the same trip with them a year ago. Another couple will join us on Saturday. Emily was Jeanette's maid of honor and vice versa, for both weddings within a month of each other. Steve is a typical high school jock who has no talent to go further. All he seems to be able to talk about is his glory days. I can probably match most of his home runs, game-winning baskets, and touchdown passes. For some reason, Jeanette and Emily were athletes in high school. They were starters on both the volleyball and basketball teams. They have the same build, each approaching six slender feet tall. Probably because she's heard them many more times than I have, Emily just stares into space as Steve tells his stories. It's not like I didn't participate in school sports. I was the starting quarterback on the junior team three years in a row. They don't allow high school students to play on the junior varsity team, so I devoted my efforts to college. Even though Steve has a college degree, I would never hire him. In fact, all four have higher education. I still need to do my dissertation, and this may delay things. According to my mentor, I should plan something in the 60-page range. I made a sketch, but it will burden me. This is probably how it should be. The presence of a master says something to employers. Don't forget to bring your golf club so we have room for groceries. Yes, sir. Anything else, sir? Cute. Just do it. I headed to the garage. As the garage door slid up, a light flickered under my car. Since I changed the oil yesterday, I decided to check it. I grabbed the folded tarp, threw it open, and threw it onto the concrete floor. Kneeling down, I saw a few drops under the oil pan. Poking my finger at it, I had no doubt that it was oil. How difficult is it to make sure the oil drain plug is tight? Apparently much tougher than I thought. Sure enough, I tightened the bolt about half a turn. One more time. Back and forth and the problem was fixed. I put the tarp back and went into the house to wash my hands. Are you ready to go? Almost. Let me wash my face first. What have you gotten yourself into? They didn't tighten the oil pan bolt. Their services may be cheap, but you need to keep an eye on their performance. Hurry up, otherwise we'll be late. Yes, sir. This earned me a stern look complete with pursed lips. We met Emily and Steve at the grocery store near the cottage, if you can call ten miles close. You would have thought that we would stay for a month. Two full shopping carts, that's something. Opening the trunk, I saw my golf clubs. Damn it, Dale! I asked you to take them out. The back seat was littered with sleeping bags and suitcases. They were joined by a jumble of foods. Only a few bags fit in the trunk. Jeanette was silent on the last stretch of the way to the hut. Having reached the hut, we began to empty the cars. I started in our back seat. After several trips, Emily and I returned to the cars. We walked past Jeanette and Steve with our hands full. Emily. I grabbed the last bag of groceries from the car. I heard her trunk slam shut. I fell a little behind Emily as she walked to my car. My trunk was open and two bags were left there. In the distance, we heard a very loud explosion. Emily and I looked up at the mountain and saw the start of a small avalanche. I've seen this happen twice already. They fall in a cascade for about 10 seconds and then stop. This time, everything was different. What started out as something about 20 feet across has now expanded to several hundred feet. You could hear him approaching, like a train approaching. Crap! He's heading towards us! In the car! In the car! I slammed the trunk shut and jumped into the driver's seat as Emily slid into the passenger seat of my car. The approaching noise was frightening. 
We both watched in horror as the snowy mountain approached. Prepare for impact. I buried my head in the steering wheel. Emily pulled her knees up and curled into a ball. The impact pushed my car like a puck on ice. A minute later, we crashed into something hard. I suspect it was only a few seconds, but I feared for my life. At one point, I heard Emily scream like a teenager on a roller coaster coming down from the first drop. I felt like my chest was about to explode. My heart rate must have gone over a hundred. I had a headache. It was completely dark. I'm alive. Are you okay, Emily? I think I'm okay. I have a bit of a headache. It feels like we're tilted. I agree. Your side is higher than mine. I found the switch and turned it on. Let there be light. You're bleeding right above your right eye, Emily said worriedly. Check me. Hmm. Beautiful hair. Slender, sweet smile. What exactly should I check? Giggling. I understand that I'm not bleeding. Well, not where I see, I winked. Emily blushed. We sat in silence for several minutes. I tried to open the door, but we were pressed tightly. A large, dark area, without snow, was visible next to the front right wheel. The lighting wasn't very good, but it looked like there were some very large trees making a roof over our heads. If we could tap into this hole, we would have enough oxygen to survive for several days. We would have to make sure to run the fan to circulate the carbon dioxide. It's not the lack of oxygen that kills you, it's the CO2 reaching lethal levels. Did you happen to take the last bag of groceries with you? Emily shook her head negatively and asked, Do you think Steve and Jeanette survived? I don't know. I have never seen what happens to houses when an avalanche of this size hits them. My heart sank. What if Jeanette doesn't survive? My eyes blurred and I wiped away a few tears. It looks like Emily did the same. I guess we haven't quite survived yet either, have we? Not until we breathe in some sun-warmed air. I wonder if anyone will understand that we are buried. I pressed the horn. It worked. At least we have a way to signal the rescuers. Every hour or so, or when we hear activity, we can beep. After an hour of almost complete silence, Emily announced, I don't want to die. Agree. I didn't know that today was my last day on Earth. Even though we don't have a phone connection, I'm going to scribble down some texts telling those I love how much I love them. What a wonderful idea. It's a pity that I don't have my phone with me. I would do the same. You can use my phone. I typed for about ten minutes before emotions overtook me. As she handed the phone to Emily, she felt the same way. For the next two hours, we passed the phone to each other. Each of us wrote several messages from the afterlife. We didn't hear anything. The battery seemed to hold up well, but we turned off the dome light when we were resting. I'm a little cold, Emily said worriedly. It's a pity we didn't empty the trunk first. The sleeping bags were still in the back seat. There is a way to get into the trunk by lowering the rear seats. I have winter gloves and a raincoat. I think I have windbreakers. Climbing into the back seat, I felt for the latch. It worked. Using my cell phone for light, I stuck my head into the trunk. A minute later, I was already wearing gloves, hats, coats, and raincoats. I also grabbed the last two bags of groceries. Yummy, celery sticks, frozen cauliflower, and potato chips were the highlights. We weren't going to starve. Remembering that I had a couple of energy drinks in my golf bag, I took them out of the trunk. I couldn't help but burst out laughing when I saw Emily in a golf suit. Warmer? Yes, it really helps. Can I offer you a stick of celery? If you do not mind. I'll make an exception for you. I stretched out in the back seat and put on the remaining golf suit. Emily lowered the passenger seat as low as she could. It's a pity we don't have a blanket, said Emily. Hey, I have these tiny towels that I use to wipe down my clubs. We can cover our faces with them. We could pull up the rugs. It's not much, but it can help. That's what we did. We each took one. We threw them over ourselves, then covered our faces with small towels. It really helped. We closed our eyes and rested. When I woke up, I realized that I had slept for two hours. Emily purred as women like to describe their snoring. Instead of waking her up by honking the horn, I lay there thinking about my life and my current predicament. I don't want to die.
Will they find us before the spring thaw? Are we really going to die an hour before they find us? My mom will be desperate. I hope Jeanette survived. Emily woke up with a start and screamed. It's okay, Emily, I'm here. It was a terrible dream, Dale. I saw our skeletons in the car. I don't want to die. Without asking Emily, I climbed into the back seat. Her warmth was pleasant. I'm not going to deny it. What time is it now? Just after seven in the evening. The sun has already set for almost two hours. That's why it's getting colder. Are we going to starve, freeze, or run out of oxygen? I think we're okay with everything except freezing. I could use some water. Turning the ignition key, I discovered that the driver's side window was jammed. Both passenger windows rolled down several inches. I checked to see if they would rise back up and then low read them again. We took the opportunity to suck on some snow to get some waiter. With a little effort, we managed to punch a hole into the darkness. We had a supply of oxygen. After running the fan for 10 minutes, I rolled up the windows again. With our horn constantly blaring, I could only hope that somewhere in the distance someone was thinking, what was that noise? Emily spoke about what I was thinking about. I need to pee. Me too. Offers? It looks like the car tilted towards the left front wheel. I'm about to drive. Don't look at me, you pervert. Wait, let me take out the camera and take a video. You will die from beatings if you do this. The sounds and smells of urine filled the car. Once finished, Emily returned to the passenger seat. I unkindly took my place in the driver's seat. I emptied my bladder, turned the key, and the windows slid down. Since the window was down, I turned on the fan. After bemoaning our predicament, we tried to settle in for the evening. After lying motionless for about 30 minutes, Emily asked, Will you behave? Do you want me to do this? What I want and what I know that I must do at a given moment in time are two completely different things. I think you should hug me because I don't want to be accused of poking you all night long. Emily climbed into the back seat, leaned against the back, and pulled me towards her. Press closer to me. I am freezing. After covering us with rugs, Emily placed her right hand on my chest, pulling me closer. The warmth of her body was too pleasant. If her hand had moved lower, my discomfort would have been revealed. With our faces covered in golf towels, sleep eventually overtook us. I didn't know how long we slept, but Emily pushed me away. I rolled to the side and watched as Emily took her place in the driver's seat. The sounds and smells of urine filled the car again. Looking at the clock, I learned that it was almost 5 a.m. Emily re-established our cuddling position. None of us wanted to sleep. What will you do if Jeanette dies? I do not get the question. Are you going to leave or stay here? What about you? What if Steve is dead? I'll probably move to live with my parents until I recover from grief. How much time do we have? About a week, I chuckled. We have plenty of water and probably enough food for another three to four days. It's hard to tell if we have enough oxygen. Is someone really looking for us? Since this is the highway department, I hope so. I snuggle up to Emily again. Her hand slid under my shirt. The warm touch of flesh on flesh was pleasant. We talked for several hours about everything and nothing. After eating a few potato chips and finishing off the celery, we got comfortable and soon fell asleep. When I woke up, I lay motionless. Emily purred softly. I looked at my watch. It was approaching five in the evening, and then I heard a dull thud, barely audible. Emily, I heard something. I started beeping three short beeps, three long beeps, and three short beeps. Emily hummed quietly. Please, please, please. We were silent for a minute, and then we both heard a knock. I repeated S-O-S. -S. Then Eureka. Their probe pole landed right on the car. I pressed the horn and didn't let go until the pole hit the car again. Even if you know you will be rescued, the longer it took, the more worried I became. Why so long? Emily pressed herself against me as I leaned over the driver's seat. From time to time, another probe would hit the car. Then we heard voices. Almost there. Hang in there. The sound of metal on metal has never felt so good. 
I pressed the horn again. The light of a miner's lantern broke through the snow. An elderly guy, bundled up, grinned at us. He cleared snow from the driver's door. I tried to open it, but the snow was still in the way. A couple more minutes of shoveling, and I felt the door begin to open. The sound of his shovel hitting the door was followed by my door swinging open about six inches. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Nothing special, the man answered. After helping me and then Emily get to the surface, we were greeted by darkness. There were probably twenty people there with their miners' hats glowing. They covered us with blankets, gave us a bottle of water, and tied us to the sled. Is the house still standing? What house? My heart sank. We stayed at 24269 Pine Way. There are two people there. He repeated my information into the microphone. After some conversation, he approached us again. We didn't find the house. It's too dark now, but we'll be back in the morning. Let's take you both to the hospital. You were under 15 feet of snow. We heard your car horn this afternoon, so we're working late into the night. Ready? Emily clung to me, wrapping both arms around my waist, and we were dragged to the ambulance. A warm ride later, we ended up in the emergency room and attracted a lot of attention. I had to put two stitches in the wound above my right eyebrow. Such was the extent of our injuries. There was no sign that hypothermia had reached a critical level. Despite this, we still spent the night in the hospital receiving fluids and slowly getting our body temperature back to normal. In the morning, Emily was released first, but she was waiting for me. I talked to the ambulance workers. They found a hut, and there are signs of life there. My heart was singing. I grabbed Emily and turned her around. She leaned over and kissed me on the cheek. For what? Because you are a true gentleman. You were so calm. I don't know if I could have done it myself. I know things would be different with Steve. He would be completely lost. So thanks again. You're welcome, and thank you too. You kept your cool, which only helped me. Who is responsible for the rescue? I found this guy in the cafeteria. I think they set up a command center there. Let's go. The next two hours were brutal. Not a word from the search party. It was about 12.30 when we received the news. From the person in charge. Two people survived. We need to use heavy equipment because the walls have collapsed. They must have been lucky to be in a place that wasn't completely destroyed. Any guesses on when you'll get to them? It's too early to say. I felt dizzy. Both are alive. Please don't cause any more harm with your bulldozers. Then came another wait. A couple of hours later, we heard his message. Both got out safely. They'll be here in 30 minutes. My eyes filled with tears. Thank you. Emily and I hugged again. I emptied my cell phone, telling all my relatives what had happened. Nobody had the slightest idea. Everyone knew that we were skiing and did not connect the avalanche with our trip. Now everyone was excited. I met Jeanette's stretcher, and Emily did the same with Steve. Both were filled with tears at the reunion. Only after lunch were we allowed into their rooms. We spent the first ten minutes clinging to each other and whispering, I love you. Hi, baby. How was your weekend? A lot of snow? Yours? Yes, there were a few snowflakes there. Her giggle was music to my ears. Her kisses were warm and her hugs divine. Emily and I managed to get into my car before it crashed. How did you two survive? Pure luck. We heard a loud roar and then a boom. Chaos ensued. We were just setting things up in the kitchen when it hit. I thought I had died, but when the noise stopped, I realized that I had survived. It was pitch black, and I could hear Steve moaning. We had about three feet of space. We stood still for about ten by twenty. That's luck. Did you have food or blankets? A few apples and a rug on the floor. I thought we would starve if we didn't freeze first. All we had were back parkas and carpet. Any injuries? I have a lot of small cuts and scratches. Steve twisted his ankle badly. How long will they keep you? At least for the night. Our body temperature is dangerously low. One nurse said it was unlikely we would have survived another night. I kissed and hugged Jeanette. The visitors were asked to leave. Well, get a good night's sleep. I'll go home and take your car. 
I'll take your clothes and bring you a new set. Jeanette nodded her head affirmatively, but then, almost in a panic, she begged, Dale, just leave them. I don't want to remind you of this. I'll throw them away. Her hands reached for the bag I was holding. Really, Jeanette, it's not a problem. You will never remember that these were your clothes. Everything is practically new. I understand. Dale, just give them to me. Please. Get some sleep. See you in the morning. Deo, give me that damn bag. Jeanette, you're all worked up. Get some sleep. See you in the morning. I think if she could get up, she would attack me. Strange. I was waiting for Emily. And sure enough, the elevator took her to the lobby. How is he? Big child. I swear he doesn't tolerate anything unpredictable. How is Jeanette? I think it's pretty good. She freaked out when I told her I was taking her clothes home. She just wanted to throw it away to erase the memory of this ordeal. Different strokes for different people. Seems really weird. It looked like she didn't want me to see. Agree. And you? What have I done? Did you leave your clothes? No. Everything is here in the bag. Can I? Emily. I glanced furtively. Her expression immediately changed. Her eyes were wild. Damn it! They had sex! Look at her pants! They're damn sticky! There's a lot more than one time here. I'm going to kill him. Emily, I dropped my bag and headed towards the stairs. The door slammed behind her. I stood there stunned. How could she? She didn't act like she was being raped. I sat down heavily on the chair. My heart was breaking and my eyes were blurry. Rage began to take over me. Ten minutes later, security escorted Emily back to the lobby. One of the guards stood ten feet away from her and warned her to behave or he would throw her out. He said they thought they were going to die. He didn't tell me how many times. Several, he answered. We thought we were going to die too. What the heck? I wanted to crash into something. I could never remember being so angry. After a moment of silence, tears began to flow down our cheeks. The phone rang. Uber will arrive in two minutes. You can come with me. I'll take you home. Okay, she said quietly through tears. It was an awkward hour. It hurt both of us. As I pulled up to her house, Emily leaned over and kissed me on the cheek. Hang in there, Dale. You too, Emily. Thanks for a fun weekend. A smile broke through the tears. You are the one I will always remember. My trip home was sad. My emotions filled the entire board. Kill her, hug her, leave her, forgive her, and finally ask, why? Sleep did not come easily. In the morning, I completed all the necessary procedures. After grabbing some food, I went into my office. Having explained my weekend, I got today and tomorrow off. I am back. I rummaged through Jeanette's clothes and pulled out some sweatpants and matching underwear. Then I was overcome with rage. I went looking again. Last Halloween, she wore a stripper costume. I found it and a lace thong. This is what you need. Since her drawers were open, I decided to move her things into the office bedroom. She can figure out how to move things around to make a sleeper sofa. Back in our bedroom, I collected the obvious feminine toiletries, filled a trash can with them, and then placed the trash can with her clothes. It took me a while to work up the courage to enter Jeanette's room. Her parents and sister fawned over her. Jeanette's eyes were red and swollen. After hugging and kissing my relatives, I stared at Jeanette. The desire to strangle her to death gave way to a tender embrace. Is this all I get? I simply nodded. Yes. She knew that, I knew. Her lower lip trembled. Will you be released today? I think yes. I responded well to the IVs and blankets. No matter how disgusting their food tastes, I can't get enough of it. Jeanette felt awkward. She couldn't look me in the eyes. I'll go have some coffee. Can I bring someone else anything? I'll go with you, son, said Jeanette's father, Fred. As soon as we were in the cafeteria, he looked into my eyes. What's going on, Dale? I thought you both must be in love with each other after the ordeal you went through. Fred, I just want to confirm that our house is not so rosy. I'll let Jeanette tell you her side. Sounds bad. This is true. I do not know what to do. We brought a tray full of coffee cups and donuts into the room. 
Jeanette wiped away her tears. After the tray was eaten, Fred gathered his group and left. Before Jeanette and I could talk, her doctor came in and told her to get ready as she was ready to go home. Jeanette took the bag of clothes I brought and went to the bathroom. It didn't take long. Do you want me to wear this? Dress the way you act. I thought we agreed not to have sex until Monday. Of course, we also made several vows that were crushed by the avalanche. Her face scrunched up and she collapsed into the bathroom. She cried for about 30 minutes. Jeanette wore this costume when she came out. With her cracked voice, happy now? Not even close. Let's go. A nurse arrived with a wheelchair. Her face showed genuine amazement. I got out to drive the car to the entrance. Everyone stared at Jeanette as she climbed out of the wheelchair and headed towards the passenger door. I didn't bother going out to help her. The ride continued in silence for about five minutes. We thought we were going to die, Dale. We too, but we didn't ruin life. This brought tears again. See Lentz again. What will happen now? Your things are in the office. The rest of the way she just sobered quietly. When we arrived at the house, she gathered her courage and muttered, I feel bad. Me too. My car was totaled and I began the process of getting my insurance company involved. I took my temporary car. On the way home, I realized that being around Jeanette right now is not what I like. I sent her a message. Don't wait. I'm not home. Her response was quick. Please come home, Dale. We can't solve anything if we don't talk. Too early. I spent the evening at a sports bar watching college basketball and hockey. It seems that cheated husbands are supposed to emit a certain smell. A few hours later, the waitress asked me if I was coping with my wife's infidelity. She warned me that I couldn't drink away my problems. Yes, I agreed. Jeanette was waiting for me when I stumbled in around 1.30 a.m. I was worried about you. My indistinct answer was something like, but I'm not. Pushing away her attempts to hug and kiss me, I closed the bedroom door and dived into the middle of the bed. In the morning, Jeanette left a note saying that she was at work and that she loved me. I couldn't hang around the house because there were too many good memories that only fueled my rage. I showed up around noon and worked until nine. Are you coming home today? The supper is ready. Too early. Stopping for something to eat, I rolled in around 10 p.m. I had to work again in the morning and couldn't afford a hangover. Jeanette was curled up on the couch in her sweatpants. For the first time since Monday, her eyes weren't red and puffy. We need to talk. Please don't shut me out. What is there to talk about? You thought you were going to die, so you cheated. You do not understand. What don't I understand? Emily and I talked for a long time about death. Our communication was verbal, not sexual. We had the same problems as you. Are we going to freeze to death? Will we die of hunger? Will they find our skeletons in the spring when the snow melts? However, unlike you, we wondered if each of you survived. How were your concerns different? Tears appeared again. They weren't there. We were talking about you guys. And then you decided that we were most likely dead. Let's have sex. Dale. No, it wasn't like that at all. So why? I don't know. I guess I was weak and scared. I'm not as strong as you. Are you going to divorce me? I don't want a divorce. I really do not know. I get goosebumps when I'm near you. The pain of betrayal is too strong. Can I at least hug you? Opening my arms, Jeanette wasted no time in crushing my ribs. Her sobs continued for several minutes before our embrace was broken. Good night, Jeanette. See you tomorrow. Good night, Dale. I love you. This was the first time I had to deal with betrayal. If I had gone through this once or twice, in high school or college, I would have learned that there is a tomorrow. Right now I wasn't sure. I just couldn't understand how supposed love gave way to lust. For the next few weeks, we lived in a cul-de-sac. I wish I had Emily's phone number. Is she really divorcing Steve? If so, will she leave? Have you spoken to Emily? Not since she burst into my room on Monday morning. I will never contact her again. She wasn't very kind. Her tongue was very rough. She praised you for being a gentleman and her hero. She told me that you know everything. That's why I cried when you showed up. 
Did you tell your parents? Fred immediately suspected something. Not really. I hoped we could get through this. The way things are going, that's unlikely, isn't it? I thought our flame was hot, but you put it out. I just don't feel right around you. Something inside me died. We'll see how the next month goes, and then I'll decide. Jeanette's eyes sparkled with tears. My soul was dead. I didn't feel anything. Four more weeks, and I was still emotionally dead around Janet. Jeanette, where are we? Can you give me one reason why we shouldn't break up? Because you are abandoning us. I did something I will always regret, but it wasn't planned. It just happened. I call it bullshit. Nothing happens for nothing. It happened because you wanted it. Jeanette was very annoyed. Not true. Damn it, as far as I know, you and Emily were together, as calmly as possible. So what game do you want to play? Fine. How long have you been lovers? I bet it was great meeting Steve again, wasn't it? This may have been Steve's first time, but I wonder how many others there have been. Jeanette pulled her knees to her chest and curled into a ball. Each of my accusations was like a slap in the face for her. Did you use our bedroom or just motels? No matter what you did, you managed to keep me in the dark. Here you go. Are you happy now? Sorry, Dale. I shouldn't have said that. No others. There have never been others. It was just a terrible decision on my part, and only when we were trapped. Please, can't we try to move past this? One thing I can tell you for sure, Jeanette, you just sealed our fate. I wanted a woman strong enough to resist. Now I know that you will always think of me as a fraud, and I will always have to deal with the question of whether you have found another set of circumstances that cause you to cheat again. I'm too young for this kind of life. I'm filing for divorce. Oh, God, no. Please, Dale. I don't want to lose you. Jeanette, I have to move on. My skin no longer breaks out in goosebumps when I'm around you. The only feeling that remains is pain. You couldn't drive the knife deeper into my heart. I'm going to instruct my lawyer to file a petition for divorce. You will be served here. There is no need to make this public. Jeanette's eyes were wet and her voice cracked. I'm really afraid. I won't dispute this. What will happen to our house? I think we need to sell it. I don't want it, and I doubt you can afford it. With a muffled answer, okay. Two days later, Jeanette was served at home. This was fair since we didn't have much to share. I will have to pay a nominal amount of child support for two years. Since this was uncontested, the divorce was granted in less than 90 days. Jeanette tried her best to get me to soften, but I couldn't, and maybe I didn't want to. I moved out shortly after submitting my documents. As predicted, since Jeanette couldn't afford the mortgage, the house was sold and what little was left was divided in half. First, Jeanetta went to her parents. She moved a few months later, but I don't know where she moved. When I think about her, I get angry and sad again. Taking revenge on Steve was tempting, but it wasn't worth it. If he is smart, he will avoid me because I may change my mind about revenge. While the divorce process was going on, some of my longtime friends did everything they could to set me up with available ladies. Although I went on a few dates, I was emotionally dead. The thought of starting a relationship landed with a thud. Is this something I have to look forward to? Five months have passed since the avalanche. After attending several by-invitation-only job fairs, I received two very attractive offers. I loved my current job, but it really couldn't compete with these offers. They told me this when I shared my suggestions with them. I got a position on the West Coast, near Palo Alto. My things fit comfortably in the car. My new apartment was no more lonely than the previous one. And that wasn't any better either. I needed a personal life that included women. I no longer knew what I wanted from life. One of these evenings, I remembered all those text messages that I had composed, Reading them warmed my soul. Telling those you love how much they mean to you was uplifting. I decided that I had to start living the life of a single person. I felt like I was spying or reading someone's diary. One by one, I read the texts that Emily composed. She was much more talented in her creativity. When I read her letter to my mother, my heart began to beat wildly. I may not have married the man of my dreams, but at least I will die in his arms. 
Jeanette is so lucky. I had to find a way to contact Emily. Jeanette's phone number no longer worked. I decided that it would be cruel to ask her to do this anyway. Remembering the conversations with Emily while waiting for our rescue, I thought that I knew what city her parents lived in. One of the photo albums I picked up had photos of our wedding along with a newsletter. This gave me my maiden name, Emily. It didn't take long to find the parents. I left a message for her mother to call me. Dale? Emily? Is this really you? How are you? Oh, Dale, I'm so glad you called. I missed you so much. I'm great. What's going on in your world? I got my master's degree and got a job on the West Coast. I've only been here for a month. Is Jeanette with you? No, I just couldn't get past it. We have been divorced for several months now. What about you? Still with Steve? No, same as you. We lived together for a couple of months, but it was too hard for me. God, I'm so glad you called. What led to this? Last week, I was throwing myself another self-pity party, and I found those lyrics that we wrote when we thought we were going to die. After reading them, I felt better. Wow, I completely forgot about them. Oh, oh, I bet you've read mine too. The man of your dreams, right? I never knew. She was my best friend. Best friends never let such things be known. So, where are you now? In Chicago. You said on the West Coast. Where? In Palo Alto. We have an office in San Jose. How close is it? Palo Alto is about 20 miles from San Jose, the airport I usually use. Maybe I can convince the boss to let me visit this office. Or maybe I should think about visiting the Windy City. Really, Dale? It would be so nice to see you. I won't do anything this weekend. I know well where the airport is so I can pick you up. How about we check the flights for Friday evening? Can you find me a place to stay? Mmm, yeah, let me work on that. Well, you know I didn't want any problems with your guys. I'll deal with them. Are you sure your girlfriends will let you go? Just like you, I will deal with them. If things get worse, I'll bring a few with me. Great idea, they can entertain my boys while you and I play checkers. I like your sense of humor, Emily, and that's just one of the many things I love about you, Dale. We talked for another 90 minutes. It was so nice to hear her voice again. So many good memories came flooding back. It was all I could do to not think about Jeanette, but I managed. On Friday, I went to work early and left around 11 a.m. When I arrived in Chicago, I texted Emily that I was heading to the passenger pickup. Dale, here! I picked Emily up and spun her around as we hugged. I received the warmest kiss this year. Glad you were able to come. Hungry? Yes, I guess I need to eat. Take me to your favorite place. Let's go. Do you want to get behind the wheel? Not really. You can take the driver's seat, just in case you need to relieve yourself. Giggling. Can you believe what we had to do? I remembered this test so many times. It was something. After a wonderful dinner at the Texas Roadhouse, Emily headed back to the highway. My heart slowed a little as she pulled into the Holiday Inn parking lot. Usually my out-of-town guests stay here. I have other plans for you, she said with a sparkle in her eyes. It won't hurt, right? Only if you resist. I'm not going to give up. As soon as we got to Emily's apartment, she ran into my arms. Kiss me. Slow touches of the tongue gave way to a serious massage of the mouth. My hands wandered, but much more slowly than Emily's. Pushing me back, they sensually tore off my jacket and shirt. Your turn. I pulled Emily's blouse out of her pants, then unbuttoned the blouse from the bottom up. Emily pulled my head to her chest. I didn't need any further instructions. My arms roamed freely around my lower torso. After a few minutes, she asked me to stand up. The belt offered little resistance, and soon the trousers slid to the floor. Be careful there. It's been a while, and I might be a little hasty with the giveaway. I hope you brought at least a six-shooter with you. How about you let me get the first one out of the way? I like your thought process. We pressed ourselves against each other, this time face to face. Should I bring you anything? A little Viagra? How about a drink or a snack? Not really. I'd rather hug you. Apparently, this was correct. M.I.W.E. fell asleep under the blanket.
I heard the sound of the shower running as the sunlight warmed my face. Standing naked and drying her hair with a towel, Emily greeted me. Good morning, darling. Did you enjoy it last night? Was it a dream or reality? I had both. You lasted much longer in my dreams. I stuck my tongue out at her. Get your ass out of bed. We have a whole day ahead of us. It was a wonderful weekend. On Sunday evening, we parted, having previously agreed that Emily would fly to San Jose in two weeks. When my turn to have fun was over, I realized that I was falling in love with Emily. Her face when we parted told me that she might be feeling the same way. I received confirmation in the middle of the week. Good evening, Emily. How is work going this week? Very good, Dale. That's why I'm calling you. They have an opening in their San Jose office. And, and I checked and qualified. And, I have strong feelings for you. But if you don't feel the same, then I'll back off. And if I say, I think I'm falling in love with you, will it help you make a decision? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, this will help. Or yes, will you still think about changing jobs? Smart ass, yes. I love you and I'm going to take this job. We talked for another hour. I was tasked with finding a suitable apartment for us within a reasonable distance from her office, the airport, and my office. As soon as she was approved for this position, her suitcases were packed. It's only been six weeks since she called me back. Sometimes life moves at the speed of an avalanche. We were in no hurry. We both had deep-rooted relationship anxiety issues. Although we had a few screams, we always managed to kiss and cuddle before bed. I work with a lot of young women and this worries Emily. She travels with men and it bothers me. It was during one of our conversations ten months after we started living together that we came to an understanding. I'm so sorry, Emily. I acted like an ass. If you can keep your vows when circumstances force you to sleep with the man of your dreams, then I have nothing to worry about when you're on the road. I don't trust men, so please avoid situations that put you at risk. Listen to me, Dale. I was unfairly petty when I said you work with all these women. You proved to me in the avalanche that you can be trusted. I may not trust the women you work with, but I am convinced that I can trust you. We looked at each other in silence for a minute, then I dropped to one knee. I don't have a ring or anything because it happened pretty quickly, but would you like to die in this man's arms or in your dreams? Pushing me back onto my back, then pressing his chest against me. Will I die quickly or what's on your mind? A very slow death. Fifty or sixty years of torment. Sign me up for the company. We enjoyed a small wedding ceremony in San Jose and then a honeymoon as far away from the snow as possible. We never skied again, and we have no desire to. Our careers became our children. But eight years later, we expanded our family when Sarah was born. She looks like her mother. Her sister Maggie came along two years later, and it will be a little more difficult for her as she is very similar to me. We learned through social media that Steve had remarried and fathered a child. We also learned that Jeanette moved to Maryland and has two children. Neither Steve nor Jeanette attempted to contact us, nor did we contact them. This relationship was buried under an avalanche. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.